Now we can go further into exponentials. In particular, we could talk about exponential equations and solving exponential equations. So what it means to solve an exponential equation is when we have x in the exponent. This is something new, most likely, than what you've seen in the past. When you solve for x, it's usually not in the exponent. We've done it where x has an exponent, like x squared or x cubed. That's what all the polynomials and finding the zeros was about, is solving for x when you have exponents on it. But we've never done x in the exponent. So we will develop throughout the exponential and logarithmic unit how to solve for x when it's in the exponent. We can't just divide by 5 here, because if we were to divide by 5, that doesn't cancel the x in the exponent. Because div dividing by 5 would just mean that we are dividing by the base of 5, which would give us the exponent of x minus 1. So we'd just be subtracting the exponent. It's not getting rid of or getting the x out of the exponent. It's just adjusting or changing what the exponent looks like. So an approach to find or solve what x is, is to get the bases the same, because we have 5 to the x is equal to 25. So if we're able to write it as the same base on the left hand side and on the right hand side, then what that means is that the exponents must be equal. I'll say that again, looking at the box up here on the right, if b to the x is equal to b to the y, so the bases are equal, and the two expressions are equal, the left-hand side is equal to the right-hand side, then that must mean that the exponents must be equal. And then from there, we can solve for x. So on this one, you might be able to just look at it and say, well, x should be 2, because 5 squared is 25. But let's just work through how we would actually solve this by matching the bases. So we first have to think about what is a common base between 5 and 25. Can we rewrite both of these as something to a power, where that something is the same? So we can't break down 5 anymore. 5 is a prime number. So we have 5 to the x. So we can check to see, is 5 a common base between these two? Can we write 25 as 5 to some power? And yes, we can. We can rewrite 25 as 5 to the power of 2, or squared. And so now that we have the bases the same, and the two expressions on the left and right are equal to each other, that means that the exponents must be equal to each other. So we have that x must be equal to 2. So here, this first step that we did was we found a common base. And then the next step here was that we set exponents equal to each other. And these are the two basic steps that you do when you are solving for variables in the exponent, is you find a common base, get both of the bases the same, and then once you have the, the bases the same, then you can set the exponents equal to each other. As we'll see in these other examples, there's a little bit more work on some where you might have to do some simplification of exponents, and then you might have to solve for x with a little bit of algebra. But let's take a look at how we would do this one. So we have 25 to the x is equal to 125. And we want to get a common base between these two. One idea is just think about the factors of these two numbers. And you might recognize that these numbers all have 5 as a factor. So you can think about, can I break down these numbers as 5 to some power? So that common base or the potential common base is 5. So we want to rewrite 25 as 5 to some power. But remember, we have the x up there in the exponent still. So we're rewriting 25 as 5 to some power. Well, we already did that. 25 is 5 squared. And this is equal to, can we rewrite 125 as 5 to some power? Yes, that power would be 3, because 5 to the third power, 5 cubed, is 125. So now, there's a little bit of work to do before we set the exponents equal to each other, because we have an exponent raised to an exponent. And we want just all the exponents to be together. We want one exponent. So to simplify or to evaluate 5 squared to the x, so power to a power, you multiply the two powers. So this would be 5 to the 2x is equal to 5 cubed. So we got a common base of 5. And it's 5 to the 2x is equal to 5 cubed. So since they're both equal to each other. That means that the exponents must be equal to each other. So we have 2x is equal to 3. And then from here, just solve for x. 
nice one step equation divide by two on both sides. And we have that x is equal to three halves. So this one's a little bit more work than the first one. We had to do some simplification in the exponent, and then we also had to do a one step uh, solving for x. On the next one, we have something different here. We have a fraction, one half, and that's raised to the x plus one power, and then we have four. So we want to think about, can we find a common base between these two? Well, thinking about four, the only way to break down four is with two. The only factors of four is two. In particular, you can rewrite four as two to the power of two. So we want to ask ourselves, can we rewrite one half as two to some power? So let's write that two to some power. And this is still all raised to the x plus one. So that's that goes on the outside, the x plus one. We're just rewriting one half as two to some power. Well, going back to the idea of negative exponents, negative exponents create fractions. So we can rewrite one half as two to the negative one. And as we're going through all these steps, we can always work backwards. And we should always be able to work backwards and see from one step to the next, am I writing the same thing or are my expressions equal to each other? So here we can go backwards. Two to the negative one is one half. No rules are broken. We're writing equal expressions. And so now here, it's the same idea as what we had previously. We had negative one in the exponent, but then we also have an exponent, which is x plus one here. So we have an exponent to an exponent. So we multiply those two. But we have to make sure that we multiply negative one to the entire expression x plus one. So it's like we're distributing negative one to x plus one. So this is two to the negative x minus one is equal to nothing to do on the right hand side. So two squared. So this step that we did here was we were doing negative one times x plus one. We we're distributing that negative one in. And now we have the same base. So bases are matching two and two. And those two expressions are equal to each other. So that means that the exponents must be equal to each other. So we can set the exponents negative x minus one is equal to two. Now solve for x this is just nice two step equation. Add one on both sides. And we have negative x is equal to three. And then different ways you can do this one, divide by negative one, multiply by negative one, all kind of the same. Essentially, we're just swapping the signs, making the three negative. So we have x is equal to negative three. And for all of these, and just in general, whenever we solve for x in an equation, we can always check our answer by plugging the x back in. So if we wanted to, we could plug in negative three into this original expression or this original equation, and we should get something that is true. For example, if we plug negative three back into here, we should get four is equal to four. If you end up with something like eight is equal to four, then you might have to go back and check your work because eight is not equal to four. On the next one here, we want to look at what could be a common base between these two. Again, think about the factors of these numbers. Well, looking at nine, the only factors of nine are three. And of course, nine and one, but we're trying to break it down more. So you can only rewrite nine as three to some power. So we can rewrite nine as three squared, which means that we want to check to see, can we write 27 as three to some power? And yes, we can. We can rewrite 27 as three cubed or three to the third power, but we still have that three X on the outside there. And so now just like we have been doing, we multiply these two exponents. So we have three cubed to the three X power. So we multiply three with three X. So we have three to the nine X is equal to three squared. Now we have a common base which means we can set the exponents equal to each other. So we have nine X is equal to two and we solve for X. This is just a nice one step algebra divide by nine on both sides. And we end up with X is equal to two ninths. Now, when you're looking at this one, three to the X is equal to 10. You might have trouble finding a common base because there is no nice common base between these two. There's no way to write three and 10 as some number to a power where that base is the same. We can't write it as three to some power and then three to some power. There's no way to do three to some power that would give you 10. So there's no nice common base between these two. 
So this is where the limitations of this matching the bases approach to come into play because we cannot find a common base between these. So this only works when there is a nice common base. However, not all hope is lost. We will develop the tools to be able to solve for x in an equation like this. But for now, we're just going to continue on with more exponential functions. And in particular, exponentials, other than probably linear functions, exponentials appear the most in real world applications. There's a lot of situations where you have exponential growth, like with money and interest rates or with population growths or with the growth of bacteria or viruses. So there's a lot of situations where exponentials come into play. One situation in particular is with interest. So interest, if you're not familiar, if you borrow money or if you put money into an account or invest money, you get interest on the money, which means the balance grows over time. And there are different ways for you to get interest or different ways for your balance to grow. One way is with what's called compound interest. So if you put money in account and you get interest in your account, which means you get a little bit of money added to your account, then you get interest again over time. But you get interest on that new account balance. So that new account balance is more money than what you started with. So you have your initial balance plus some interest. And then over time, you get interest on your interest. And then you get interest on that interest. And so this like reinvestment or this idea of interest on interest is called compound interest. And we have a formula that can find the end balance of an account with compound interest over time. So the different variables that we have for this equation or this formula a is the account balance after the compounding, so like the final or future value. P is the principal or the original invested amount. R is the interest rate as a decimal. N is the number of times compounded per year. T is the number of years. So we're going to look through a situation and see how the money changes depending on the amount that we have compounded. So this situation is we have $1,000 to invest at 10% interest for 10 years. We want to figure out what will the end balance be if we have these different compounding amounts. So let's take a look at this first one, yearly. So the number of times per year that you're going to compound if you're compounding yearly, well, it's just once. You just compound once a year if it's yearly. So let's list out all the variables. We have A, P, R, N, and t so going down the list a the future value is what we're looking for that's what we don't have put a question mark there p is the initial investment amount that's the one thousand dollars r is the interest rate is ten percent as a decimal is 0.1 or 0.10 same thing n that's what we just discussed is number of times compounded per year that's just once t is the number of years which is 10 years so we just plug all these values into the equation that we have above and then find A. So we have A is equal to 1,000 times 1 plus 0.1 over 1 to the 1 times 10. So again, that's A is equal to P, which is 1,000 times the quantity 1 plus R, which is the rate 0.1 over N, number of times compounded per year, which is 1, to the power of N times T, which is 1 times 10 years. So we can actually simplify this a little bit by hand, because some of the numbers are nice. We have 1,000 on the inside here, 1 plus 0.1 divided by 1. 0.1 divided by 1 is just 0.1. And so we have 1 plus 0.1, so this is 1.1 on the inside, to the power of 1 times 10 which is just 10. So now this is something we can just throw into the calculator. So when we throw this into the calculator, we have 1,000 times 1.1 to the power of 10. And so we get about 2,593 and 74 cents. So the end balance or future value is about 2,500 93 and 74 cents. So that's how much we will have in the account after 10 years if it's compounded yearly with 10% interest. So on the next one, we are compounding quarterly. So that means our N will be four because there's four quarters in a year. And we set this up the exact same way. The only thing that's changing is the N 
value. So what this equation would look like or the formula would look like is A is equal to 1000 times 1 plus the rate 0.1 over n, which is now 4, to the power of n times t, which is 4 times 10. And let's throw this one into the calculator. We can do it all at once. So we have 1,000 times the quantity 1 plus 0.1 divided by 4 raised to the power of. Now, if we're doing exponents, we could just type 40 here because it's 4 times 10. However, if we're doing calculations in the exponents, we want to put it in parentheses, so 4 times 10 in case we didn't know how to do that. So this is 2,685 and 6 cents. So the end balance here is approximately 2,685 and 6 cents. Now this is more money than compounded yearly. We can see compounded yearly, we have $2,593 and compounded quarterly is $2,685. So this increase is actually an increase of $91.32. And then let's see what happens if we compound monthly. So monthly, there are 12 months in a year. So the N is 12. Everything else stays the same, just like the other two. So we have the end balance A is equal to P, which is 1,000 times the quantity 1 plus the rate, which is 0.1 over N, which is 12, to the power of N times T, which is 12 times 10, and if we throw this into the calculator, and you can practice this if you like, we should get about 2,707.04, or $2,707.04. And this amount of money is also an increase. It's an increase from compounded quarterly. How much of an increase? Well, we're adding $21.98. So that's how much more money we make if we compound monthly versus quarterly. Now let's take a look at compounded daily. So a big increase in N, which would be 365, because there's 365 days in a year. So we set this up the same way. The only thing that's changing is the N. So we have A, the ending balance is equal to P, the initial balance, which is 1,000, times the quantity 1 plus R, which is 0.1, over N, which is 365, to the power of N times T, so 365 times 10. And if we put this into the calculator, we get the ending balance is about $2,717.91. So this increase in balance is about $10.87. So you can see we're getting more money each time, but it's less of an increase each time. So going from yearly compounding, so once a year to four times a year, that's an increase of $91. Going from four times a year to 12 times a year, that's about $21 or $22 of an increase. And then going from monthly to daily, so 12 to 365, is only an increase of $10.87. So the increase in our balance is getting smaller and smaller and smaller. So this leads to this limiting increase or this idea of how many times we compound has this limiting value and if we keep increasing the n to bigger and bigger numbers that increase in balance is going to get smaller and smaller and smaller until we eventually sort of level out to close to the same number so sort of like a horizontal asymptote on the balance and that leveling off a value is related to this what we call growth multiplier. So as n grows to infinity, this growth multiplier, what we call a constant, so it's just a number, which that number is e. I know that sounds weird, that number is e. That number is about 2.72 or so, and it appears so much in math that we give it a specific name, and that specific name is e. And this number e is actually in nearly every single calculator. It's a very important number and pops up so much in math that most calculators have it. And so this affects or changes what the compound interest formula looks like. In particular, if we say that we are compounding continuously, so as that number of times compounded gets more and more frequent, we get closer and closer to say compounding continuously, so we're always compounding. 
then the compound interest formula turns into this guy here. So this is the compound interest formula if we are compounding continuously. So let's take a look at a few examples of a similar situation where you have $1,000 to invest at 10% interest, but we're now compounding continuously. So you want to see how much money we're going to have after these different amounts of time. So we're compounding to continuously. So we're using this equation A equals P times E to the R T. So let's list out all of our variables. We have A, we have P. We're not listing out E as a variable because E is a number. And we'll see where to find that in the calculator. We also have the rate R and the time T. So the value that we're looking for is the ending balance. We're trying to see how much money we will have after 10 years. So we don't know A, put a question mark there. Next, we have P, the initial investment, which is $1,000. Next, we have the interest rate, which is 0.1 or 10%. And then lastly, we have the time, which is 10. So plug all this in into the compound continuous formula and we have a is equal to p which is 1000 times e again just a number to the power of 0.1 times 10. so let's take a look at where to find e in the calculator in desmos so now that we're in desmos we don't have any e popping up on our screen here but if we go to the function tabs f u n c Right here, we have a bunch of functions on the left. We don't need to worry about those. And then we have some functions on the right. And down below, we have the number E here. So click on that. You can see that's about 2.718. And you can see how important it is. The only other number which we give to a name that's in this calculator is pi. And you probably heard pi before. It's a very famous, well-known number that is 3.14 about. So that's how important and how common E is, is that it has its own button. And in fact, it has two buttons in this calculator. It has E and E to the X. So oftentimes we will have E to some power so we can be using this E to the X button. So going back to the actual calculation that we wanna do is 1000 times E to the, so we wanna to go to functions, E to the X, and that exponent is we put in parentheses 0.1 times 10. And so we have that this is 2,718 and 28 cents. So we have the end balance is approximately $2,718 and 28 cents. Now taking a look at comparing this with compounded 365 times in a year, so N is 365, it is a very small jump from 365 times compounded to continuously compounded. That's a jump of about 30, 37 cents. So it's a very small jump from 365 days compounded to continuously compounded. So you can see that leveling off really starts to happen once you start to get those bigger end values. So next, let's take a look at 20 years. So everything's going to stay the same except for the time t. So we're looking for A, the ending balance. We have the principal P is $1,000. That's the starting amount. We have the interest rate R is 0.1. We have time is 20 years. So let's search for all these into the function. And we have A is equal to P, which is 1,000 times E, which again is a number to the power of 0.1 times 20. Let's throw all this into the calculator. And in fact, we can just change one small value in the calculator, change that 10 to a 20. And we have that that ending balance is 7,389 and six cents. So the ending balance is approximately $7,389 and six cents. And then on the last one here, same thing, just to save us some time of writing out all the variables we have, time is going to be 30. That's the only thing that's going to be changing. So putting all this in, we have A is equal to P, which is 1000 times E to the power of R, which is 0.1 times T, which is 30. And throw this into the calculator and we get approximately $20,085.54. So you can see that with this exponential growth as time is getting 
larger and larger, greater and greater, we have these huge jumps in value. So going off of the same situation of investing $1,000 at 10% compounded continuously, so compounded continuously, that's telling us to use the function A equals P times E to the R T. That's the function that we're using because we're compounded continuously. We want to figure out how long it would take for our investment to triple. How long it would take our investment to triple. So this, how long it would take, this is asking us for a time. We're trying to find T. And for our investment to triple, that's the key word there to help us figure out the rest of the values. So let's list out all the values in the formula. So we have A is equal to blank, P is equal to blank, not E, R and T. So we just said that we're looking for T. So put the question mark on T. We have $1,000 is the starting amount. We have 10% is the interest rate, so 0.1. Now the question is, what should the end balance be, the A? Well, if we're trying to figure out how long it will take for our investment to triple, if we start with $1,000, then we're looking to end with $3,000. So in other words, A should be 3000 And that comes from doing $1,000, the initial amount, times 3. We're just tripling. So let's throw all of this into our A equals P times E to the RT formula. So we have A, which is 3000 is equal to P, which is 1,000, times E to the R, which is 0.1, times T, which we don't know. So here, we're trying to solve for T. So this is a little bit different than previously. Previously, we're just punching everything into the calculator, and we had A already solved for on, on one side of the equation by itself. But now we want to solve for T. So there's a little bit more work to do here. We actually have to solve for the variable, try to get it by itself. So remember, when we are solving for a variable, we're trying to get it by itself. We have all these operations happening to t. We have the 1,000 out front that's multiplying. We have the base of e. We have the 0.1 in the exponent. And so when we are solving for a variable, we want to undo all of these operations happening to t, to the variable. And since we're undoing everything, we want to work backwards with the order of operations. So to work backwards with the order of operations, we would normally do the 1,000 out front, that multiplication, we would normally do that last because the rest of the operations are dealing with exponents and parentheses. So solve for t, we want to get rid of or cancel out the multiplication of 1,000 first. So we divide by 1,000. So divide by 1,000 on both sides, and we have 3 is equal to e to the point 0.1t. Now this goes back to when we are trying to match the bases as I scroll up. When we're trying to match the bases, we came into an issue on this last one where we were trying to do 3 to the x is equal to 10. There was no nice common base between these two, so we weren't able to match the bases because we couldn't find a base, so we couldn't solve for x. And that is a similar situation here where we have the base of 3 and the base of e. e is an irrational number, which means that it's a number that has a decimal that goes on forever that you can't find a pattern in. So there's definitely no nice common base here. So we can't find uh, a common base, so there's no nice common base. So we're going to need more tools to solve this, and we'll come up with those tools very soon. However, we could solve this with graphing. Every time that we're solving for a variable, technically, we can write it as a function. So if we wanted to, we could create a function out of this. In particular, that function, what it would be is we would move everything to the same side of the equation. So we move everything to the same side, which means we're moving the 3 over to the right side. So we subtract 3 on both sides, and we have 0 left over on the left-hand side is equal to 0.1t minus 3. So this right here is an equation that we can technically graph. And what we're graphing is the function y equals e to the point 0.1t minus 3. This is the function we're graphing. And we when we set the y to be 0, 
we're saying that we're solving for the x-intercept. So in the graph here, what we're really doing is we're finding an x-intercept. And so when we go into Desmos and say, try to graph this, so this is what this function looks like in Desmos. And what we're looking for is the x-intercept. So we can see the x-intercept, if we zoom in, is right around here, just a little bit past 10. And we can see it's very close to 11. So just barely under 11 is when we would have that x-intercept. So finding a solution is really the same thing as finding the x-intercept of this function. So if we wanted to, we could graph generally what this function looks like. It's an exponential, so it's kind of like that. And this x-intercept is at, you know, it was about 10.9 or so was the x. And then, of course, this y is the 0 because that's an x-intercept. So what we're looking for is we're looking for the x-intercept. And so we can say that the solution here is that t is approximately 11 years. But there has to be a better way, a more defined and robust way of solving variables in the exponent. And of course, there is. And the way of doing that is with an inverse. And this introduces a new type of function, which is called a logarithmic function. So the most important thing to remember with logarithmic functions is that a logarithmic function is an inverse. It's the inverse function of an exponential. So let's clear up some space right here. I'm going to say these two are inverses. At the end of the day, whenever you're working with logarithmic functions, just remember that they are the inverse function of exponential. And the reason we're doing this is because we have a lot of situations where we need to solve for x or solve for a variable in the exponent. Normally with algebra, we can undo all those operations. We can undo multiplication with division. We can undo addition with subtraction and vice versa on both of those. However, when we have a variable and an exponent, we don't have any nice inverse operation. So in order to solve for the variables in the exponent, or in other words, to get the variables out of the exponent, we need logarithmic functions. That's what they do. They solve variables in the exponent. So we have all the basic properties of the exponential function that we talked about before. So exponential functions will generally look like a times b to the x, where b is greater than zero and not equal to one. We talked about y. And we're going to use the base here. The b is equal to two. That's just a choice that we're using here is two to the x. And so we're going to look at the inverse of this function. So the inverse of this function is going to be log base b of x. So log is a function, just like a square root is a function. Log is a function where the input is x. So it's like f of x. Log is never multiplying anything. Log is a function which has an input. That input is x. And the way that we say this is we say log base b of, we say of because x is an input, log base b of x is how we say that expression. So for example, the inverse of y equals 2 to the x would be log base 2 of x. So that b in the log function is the same b in the exponential function. And so remember, these are inverses. So let's think of this as an inverse. So remember, inverses, all they do is swap x and y. So looking at the table, that's the nicest way to look at inverses, I think, is looking at the table. You're just swapping x's and y. So the point negative 3, 1 8 becomes the point 1 8, negative 3. The point negative 2, 1 4 becomes 1 4, negative 2. And then we also have 1 half, negative 1. We have 1 0. And then keep swapping x and y. So we have the point 2 1. 4, 2, and 8, 3. So looking at the graph of the exponential, which we've seen before, so we have the exponential function here. 
And so the logarithmic function, remember that inverses are also, we say, just a reflection over the line y equals x. So we have the line y equals x drawn here. So it should be just a reflection, so this diagonal flip over this line. But let's actually graph out these points, plot out these points that we have for the logarithmic function that we found with inverse. So let's start with the nicer points. The point 1, 0 is a nice point. Plot that out. We have the point 2, 1. Plot that out. We have the point 4, 2. We have the point 8, 3, which goes off the graph just a tiny bit. And then plotting out some of these smaller points, we have 1 half, negative 1, 1 quarter, negative 2, 1 eighth, negative 3. So it's getting close and close to that y axis. So let's plot out these points, connect the dots, give it a little bit of a curve. And remember, plotting out the original exponential function kind of next to this, we can see that this is very much a direct reflection over the line y equals x. So in the red here, this is the y equals log base 2 of x. And then in the green here, this is y is equal to 2 to the x. So we have these two functions that are inverses of each other, and you can see that they're just direct reflections. And that's how we define the logarithmic function, is it is an inverse of the exponential function. So talking about all the properties of the logarithmic function, we have domain, which remember with inverses, the domain of the inverse is the range of the original. So this domain should be zero infinity, the range of the inverse is the domain of the original, so this is negative infinity to positive infinity. There are no extrema, no maxes or mins. The original y equals 2 to the x has a horizontal asymptote at y equals 0, so the x-axis, which means that the log is going to have a vertical asymptote at x equals 0. And looking at domain and range on the graph itself, you can actually see this, that there is this vertical asymptote at x equals 0 right here, this line along the y-axis. So it gets very close to the y-axis, never actually touches the y-axis, which means you can never plug in 0 into the function. In particular, or going even further, you can't plug in negative numbers either. So you can't plug in zero, you can't plug in negative numbers, you can only plug in positive numbers. And then the range, it goes down forever and it goes up forever. And then talking about the end behaviors, as x goes to positive infinity, well the y's will also go to positive infinity. Think about end behavior of the original function is positive infinity and positive infinity, so that's going to be the same. So these are both positive infinity, you're swapping x and y. However, talking about end behaviors on the original is as x goes to negative infinity, so the left tail, y goes to zero, these would be swapped. As x goes to zero, as x gets closer and closer to zero, y goes farther and farther down to negative infinity. You can see that on the graph here, the left tail gets flattened out at x is equal to zero. So when you get closer and closer to zero for x, you get farther and farther down for y. X-intercepts, there is an x-intercept here at 1. So the point 1, 0 is the x-intercept. Remember, inverses. The original had a y-intercept of 0, 1, but we're swapping x and y, so that means there's an x-intercept on the inverse of 1, 0. And then y-intercepts, there are no y-intercepts because to get a y-intercept, that means you would be plugging in 0 for x, which we cannot do. And this is always increasing as well. And the original function is 1 to 1, which means the inverse function is also 1 to 1. And that's why we can find the inverse, because the original function is 1 to 1.